Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Better Sex Podcast. This is Jessa, and I am so glad you're here. And in fact, I know I say that every time, but I am so, so glad you're here because today's show is great. And I'm just so excited to have had this opportunity because I'm talking to Michael Bader. And he wrote a book, he's written several, but he wrote a book called Arousal, The Secret Logic of Sexual Fantasies. And this is a staple in my sex therapy practice. I recommend this to people all the time. I love it. And he's talking about eroticism, arousal, sexual fantasies, what they are, how they serve us, why they exist. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. Uh, I think you're going to just love this. Uh, We all have fantasies to one degree or another, so this is going to apply to everybody, but it's really mind-shifting to think about this, this concept about how they work and why we have them. So I hope you really enjoy the show. And before we start the show today, it is sponsored by Intimacy with Ease. It's a method to help otherwise happy couples achieve a sex life that is easy and fun for both of them. So you can actually just enjoy your sex life with zero stress. For more information, if you want to watch a brief little training video that's available, all of that, go to intimacywithease.com. Oh, Michael, thank you so much for being on the show with me. It's great to be here. So I was saying to you before I hit record, I recommend the book Arousal to so many of my sex therapy clients because it's so helpful to sort of normalize, you know, so many people come in distressed about what turns them on, you know, and I feel like, wow, wait, there's this whole theory about what this does for us and everything. So (laughs) maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, well, got the ideas for this book. I was um, in training at the Psychoanalytic Institute in San Francisco and um Psychoanalysts think they know a lot about sex, (laughs) but it turns out their ideas about sexual fantasy and preferences are extremely abstract and very high level abstract theory that I felt really didn't help the person in the consulting room who came in, you know, uncomfortable, guilty, ashamed of their sexual preferences and fantasies. So I just thought we need something that has some theoretical rigor, but really is helpful to the clinician and to the patient. And so at the time, I was working with a a guy named Joseph Weiss, who uh, was a psychoanalyst who developed a set of ideas about psychological functioning that I felt were very particularly relevant Mm. to understanding sexual fantasies. And if I could just take a minute to, to just frame the context, he Weiss was interested in the concept of safety, which is, you know, not a a foreign concept to most therapists or certainly wasn't to most analysts. But what he argued was that Freud was wrong in one particular way. Freud's idea was that there's a balance of forces in the mind between sexual impulses and desires and then defenses. Okay. And that if the sexual impulses were strong enough, they could sort of break through the defenses and be manifest in the world. And Weiss said no. Weiss said that people bring forth uh, repressed or inhibited desires and wishes and feelings only when it's safe to do so. And that our egos have a lot of control and a lot of say-so in determining what constitutes safety. So I started to think about that in relation to, well, you know, Weiss was mostly talking about what happens in psychotherapy, that people bring up memories and they 
make developmental steps forward and they bring up inhibited feelings only when they consider it safe to do so with the therapist. Right, right. So then I started thinking, well, how might this apply to sexual fantasy? And and what I came up with was this notion that in a nutshell is this, that sexual fantasies have a function. The function is to make it safe for the person to experience sexual excitement or pleasure. Now, that implies that in ordinary everyday mental functioning, there are a lot of things that make us inhibit or repress our sexual um, arousal, our sexual desires. One of the main classes of, I guess you say, sources of inhibition uh, has to do with the ways we feel guilty about our sexual needs. And my argument was and is that sexual fantasies are constructed um, creatively in our unconscious minds as a way to transcend or you might say disconfirm our guilty notions about what's okay and what's not okay to express. So let me give you an example. Yeah, I was going to say, I think examples yeah, would be helpful here. <laughs> example, examples are everything. So let's say somebody, one of the things that I tried to explore in the book was that there is, I think, an essentially selfish dimension to sexual excitement. I call it sexual ruthlessness, okay. not in this sense of somebody being sociopathic or uh, mean, but it was borrowing from a concept that the psychologist, psychoanalyst Winnicott wrote about, which had to do with that there is a selfish quality to sexual excitement at its best. And of course, there's also an empathic dimension to it, where if somebody were only selfish, it would be like um, masturbating in the presence of another person. Yeah. But if someone is so enmeshed in an experience of empathy towards one's partner, then that can actually inhibit sexual pleasure. And so I thought, well, think about some of the sexual fantasies or scenarios that excite people who might otherwise be afflicted with this sense of guilt. And of course, one of the obvious ones has to, has to do with fantasies of dominance and submission. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of people that have some notion, some, I don't know, attraction to the fantasy of surrender, of somebody else having control over what's going on sexually and what's going on with your body sexually. And that control can take lots of different forms. It could be an overt sadomasochistic fantasy, or it could just be that somebody is drawn to a partner who looks a little bit rough or looks a little bit self-centered. And the reason that's exciting is because the person with that fantasy doesn't have to feel guilty about hurting the other person. Mm. So this is it in a nutshell, that if we feel guilty and worried about the other person's welfare too much, it inhibits our sexual excitement. And then we have to come up with strategies unconsciously to overcome that mm. guilt and sense of responsibility. And sadomasochistic or dominant submission fantasies almost always have that function. So you could see it from the point of view of the person being dominated, that they can let go and let sort of let the cat out of the bag, knowing that the other person's in control and is not going to be hurt. Now, yeah. the person doing the dominating also could have a version of this. And where you see this is in the fantasy that I would be strong and I would dominate you and you would get excited by it. Yeah, I would love it. So that must you absolve your it. guilt. Right. Exactly. Right, right. Because if you love it and you're getting turned on by it, it by definition means you're not being hurt by it. Yeah. So it's just so interesting. A lot of these strategies have to do with somehow navigating the mind around or away from those places that they might find inhibits them. Yeah. 
And guilt is one of the main classes of feeling that I think inhibits sexual desire. Yeah. What seems so interesting to me, though, I mean, so many people struggle with their fantasies. Like, I don't think they would immediately think, oh, this is safe. (laughs) You know, it's like the the fantasy is serving our safety. And yet the fantasy itself feels so unsafe for people. That's so so interesting. And uh, what kind of fantasies are you thinking of that someone might experience as risky or 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 just incongruent, not like literally unsafe to their their well-being, but you know it it seems edgy, it seems intimidating. How can this be the thing that turns me on? This doesn't you know, I don't think people are thinking, oh, well, somehow there's safety in this. Oh, yeah, no, no, it's a really good point because there are a lot of women, for instance, who are you know proud, self-respecting feminists that enjoy being dominated sexually. Mm-hmm. And if you talk to them, they feel ashamed of that as if, it reflects some primary weakness in them. Yeah. When, when in fact, what it re- that's actually quite wrong almost all the time. It, it often, if not always, reflects a fear of their own power. Uh-huh. So I've treated women who are be considered, you know, activists in feminist politics, who are very proud and um, accomplished in that world, who have fantasies of just being taken by some ruffian, yeah. which in the real world would be horrifying. Right. But in the fantasy, what she imagines is that she can let go of all of her reservations and inhibitions because this other person doesn't give a damn about her. <laughs> yeah. Therefore, she doesn't have to give a damn about him huh. or, or her. Right, right. So how much, I mean, I have so many questions. <laughs> How much do you think we are accepting the fantasies, understanding the role they serve us versus trying to address the guilt we feel in the first place? Right. <laughs> you well, know, see, I, right. No, that's a really good question for a psychotherapist. What I think is that a sexual fantasy is a window into the person's unconscious mental life. Freud thought the dreams were the road to the unconscious, but I think it's sexual fantasies, actually. Mm-hmm. And I think that if you understand someone's sexual fantasy, you almost always get a sense of what it is that plagues them in their everyday life. Mm -hmm. So like I was saying before, if someone's fantasy is unconsciously intended to overcome feelings of guilt, feelings that you're supposed to always take care of the other person, that you're responsible for the other person's welfare, that you have to carefully interrogate the other person's inner life in order to show empathy. If you have all of those things, they can inhibit sexual desire and invariably they interfere with other aspects of your life. Yeah. So what you're seeing in this, in the consulting room in an analysis of sexual fantasy is the revelation of someone's core beliefs that almost invariably afflict them and interfere with life. So right away, you're using sexual fantasy, not just to help the person go feel less embarrassed about their sex life, but as a, as a window into the things they're coming into therapy to get help with, which is almost never their sexual fantasy life. Right, right, right. But I believe you wrote, though, that this preference, this fantasy is not going to go away. This is not something we heal or fix or change, right? This is always going to be the thing we're drawn to. Isn't that interesting too, right? So if let's just say if sexual fantasy is sometimes an attempt to overcome feelings of guilt and responsibility, you say, well, in human development, given that attachment is so central, are we ever going to get to a point where we don't feel a sense of worry, responsibility, and guilt towards people we love? And I'd say the answer is no. I'd say we're always going to have some shadow of that, which therefore will always make sexual fantasy necessary. Yeah. You know, you have people that will suffer a lot, for instance, in my practice, from survivor guilt. The guilty sense that they have more of the good things in life than their parents. Now, it's supposed to be that generations leave their families, get better, overcome stuff that their parents had to struggle with, and have a better life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So if that's the sort of course of human attachment and development, then invariably people are going to experience some version of survivor guilt. And if they do, it's going to show up in the bedroom and they're going to have to have some strategy for overcoming it unconsciously. And I want to make the point that these things are constructed unconsciously on an It's a non-conscious processing system that we have in the mind. It happens instantly, so fast and so immediately that we think it's biological. We think, oh, yeah, I saw her across the room and it's just something in my brain, you know, just but it's not that there's actually a complex story going on at that moment that the person is not aware of. Yeah. What they're aware of is that they the outcome is arousal. Yeah. Do people need to analyze <laughs> their fantasies and understand the, why this thing keeps them safe? Like, what's the value in doing that? That's a really good question. You know, I, I'll give you an example. I saw a guy who came in because he had no libido, he had no sexual interest in his wife. And uh, his wife was bummed out by this, and he was too. And so he came in, he told me a little bit about his life. He said, His mother had just moved to the area from back east. This was in California. And uh, she was kind of a martyred, guilt-tripping mother who uh, was complaining a lot that he didn't spend enough time with her. His wife, he loved quite a bit, but he also mentioned she was depressed for quite a while because she had lost a child from another marriage several years earlier. So that's the context. Okay. So he, he comes in. And he tells me, and I asked him, do you masturbate? And he said, well, yeah, he said, I use porn. And I said, well, okay, what kind of porn? And he said, um, oh, you know, he laughs, embarrassed a little bit. And he says, oh, you know, the usual kind. (laughs) And I just said, well, okay, humor me a little bit. Like, what is the usual kind for you? And he stirs around. He's a little uncomfortable. And he says, well, he says, it's just like women giving blowjobs to men. And the women have big breasts and everyone's excited. It's an exciting orgy kind of scene. So what I thought about and I told him, I said, here's what I think. I think in this fantasy, it's an attempt that you're making to overcome the sense that you're supposed to take care of unhappy women. Yeah. Even if it means that you suffer as a result of it. And so in the fantasy, the women's large breasts symbolize that they have a lot to give to a man Mm -hmm. and that they want to give to the man. And they're excited about the prospect rather than what you ordinarily feel is that the woman needs something from you Mm -hmm. that you're obligated to provide. And that experience inhibits you and really interferes with your quality of life. Now, he loved this idea because I'm basically saying, you know, man, like you have a right to get more from people that you care about or are, you know, intimate with. And you've spent your life having to take care and feel responsible. And that really has been, I don't know, a bummer. I mean, that's really (laughs) held you back. And he really related to that. Yeah. So, So that's where... The sexual fantasy, analyzing it, immediately gets us into a different conversation. The conversation now is about how he came to feel growing up that he was supposed to take care of unhappy women. Mm -hmm. That is a core, what I call pathogenic belief that I think is very common. Yeah. And that a lot of sexual fantasies are attempts to overcome Because that feeling that you're supposed to take care of unhappy women comes into the bedroom and makes really maximum sexual arousal impossible. Yeah. So it really highlights that core dilemma that somebody has. So you can tackle that in the rest of your life, right? You can advocate for something different. You can try to shift things. It's yeah. So it's. And I I would be helping this guy be more selfish in certain situations, right? I mean, it wouldn't just be we talking about sex. I'd be talking about how in other areas of his life, maybe he could be more selfish at work, at home, with his kids, with his mother. Right. It's Jessa here, just taking a quick break. Thanks for listening. 
Are you interested in being a guest on the show? I'm always looking for people with expertise to share that could enrich other people's sex lives. And I'm also interested in hearing from people who have transformed their own intimate relationship and would want to share their story with my listeners. So if you've got something to contribute to the discussion and want to see about being featured on an upcoming episode, please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, and check out the Be a Guest details. You'll find everything you need there. Again, I have so many questions. I'm trying to decide what to ask first. There is a difference between fantasizing about things and wanting to do them, right? Maybe you could speak to that for a minute, because just because something's erotic to think about doesn't mean we want well, to do it. No, that's right. That's a really good, that's a good point. Like, so sexual fantasies, when they, they get enacted in the real world, they have to be negotiated. You know, like people are not, despite the caricature of certain types of men, let's say. People actually live in a real social world in which they understand intuitively that they can't get everything they want mm -hmm. and that their sexual fantasies might not engage another person in a way that's safe and fun and good for everybody. Yeah. But usually the, somebody's core sexual fantasy, which you can see most clearly when they masturbate, because okay. when someone masturbates, they have complete control over the script. Yeah. And it's entirely a function of their own mind. And then in the real world, they have to find ways that that can be embedded in some way uh, in the actual sexual choreography that they create with a partner. So, for instance, sexual fantasy, we usually think about as um, private daydreaming ideation. You know, mm -hmm. but sexual fantasy also is embedded in all of our sexual preferences. Right. And that's what I think is so useful about this notion, because let's say you're you find yourself like one guy I treated attracted to a partner who is very narcissistic, self-centered. And but the sexual chemistry is kind of hot. This is something that I've seen clinically a number of times. What that usually reveals is that the person's experience of a partner's narcissism mistakenly feels like the partner is strong. Right, right. The partner is sure of him or herself, looks confident. Now, often what the problem is, is that the sex can be hot. But the relationship really <laughs> suffers because <Right. laughs> the person's unable to be generative and giving and reciprocal. Yeah. But you can see where the attraction starts with, you know, I, I had a guy who saw his future wife across the hall in a, a college class. And this was a, a woman that he never he was friends with, but he'd never really felt sexually attracted to. But he did that day. He felt some kind of energy that was sort of exciting to him. And he pursued her and married her. And years later, as a terrible marriage, he and I were talking about what was it in that moment that made it different? And here's what he said. He said, I don't really know, but I do know this really funny detail. Like when I saw her, she was wearing a kerchief over her head. Probably because she hadn't washed her hair or something for <laughs> right. a day or two. And he said, something about that kind of struck me, kind of rang a bell. I said, well, what was it? He said, well, I don't know. Maybe it's something that made her look a little more masculine. She had long hair and it's very feminine, but now looked a little more masculine. Well, why would that be a turn on? Because to him, that meant she was strong. Right, right. And if she was strong, he couldn't hurt her. Right, right. And you wouldn't have to worry so much about taking care of her. Exactly. Now, it turned out she was kind of quite cold and narcissistic and withholding, and it was a terrible marriage. But you could see where the sexual excitement, and it helped us begin to examine how guilty this guy was. Yeah. Well, then I'm thinking about the example of something like a rape fantasy, or like you said, taken by a ruffian in real life, it would be awful, right? Terrible. Like just because we imagine it does not mean this is something we actually want to do. That's exactly right. You know, I, I was on a TV program once and the guy asked me about 
porn and whether I thought it was always um, destructive and pathological. And I said, look, you know, a guy can go and look at porn that depicts a woman having sex with several men, you know, a gangbang. Yeah. Doesn't mean he wants to go home and do that with his wife. Right. Right. And it's really important to understand the difference because the difference, the porn fantasy is a fantasy that has an unconscious aim, which is simply to produce pleasure and arousal. Mm -hmm. In the real world, going home with his wife, he has to navigate and negotiate a huge range of issues around love and attachment and care and empathy, caretaking, all of that, which are also very important to him. Yeah. And I'm imagining that somebody with that uh, if that's what they're watching in porn, the way that gets helps them be safe potentially is, oh, I'm not solely responsible for pleasuring this woman. That's exactly you know, right. it's like it's yeah. a shared burden. All of a sudden I can feel stronger, or more confident. That's very, very true. You really put your finger on it. You know, years ago, Nancy Friday wrote a series of books where he, she collected women's sexual fantasies. Yeah, yeah. And it was very revolutionary at the time. That fact that women had sexual fantasies, was a, a, you know, a news flash. To Surprise. Many right, <laughs> right. Hello. And one of the most common fantasies her women informants had was actually having sex with several men. Mm -hmm. And when you looked into it a little bit deeper, what you found was two things were happening. First of all, the woman didn't have to worry about wearing a man out. Mm hmm because that's a common worry some women have of being too much for the man. Yeah. If there's two men, they don't have to worry about that as much. And secondarily, the attention of two men reassures her about how special she is. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I make a point of in the book is that there's another whole class of fantasies that have as their function to negate or eliminate feelings of shame, mm. embarrassment, uh, inferiority, inadequacy, helplessness, the whole collection of feelings we associate with depression, actually. Yeah. And so there are a range of fantasies that have as their purpose to undo or overcome inhibiting feelings of shame and embarrassment. Yeah. But here's the key point. Helplessness is one of those feelings. Helplessness makes it impossible to feel pleasure. Yeah. And the helplessness that's enacted in a sadomasochistic connection is not real helplessness. The bottom in the situation has a lot of control and something's being replayed. The bottom has a lot of control over what happens. Yeah. In real helplessness, like rape, real rape, is never exciting. Right. And it's incompatible with excitement, yeah. actually. Well, it also makes me think, you know, if a couple comes in and the woman is concerned, her, her male partner is watching porn and she's all worried about who he's looking at in the porn as if it's about the woman. And I've long believed it's really about who the guy can pretend to be in that scene. What does it allow him to be? Yeah, I've thought about this a lot. You know, it's really interesting because if you're the woman, it makes sense that you would feel threatened by the fact that he's getting off looking at another woman. Yeah. But it's not the same as having an affair. Right. He's not loving her. He's not giving the best of himself to her. He's not feeling cared for uh, and caring in the situation. It is a functional, intentional effort to get sexually aroused and have an orgasm. But it could be a little bit of a glimpse into his own sense of inadequacy because yes. <laughs> he's not getting yes. this young, hot, 18 year old blonde in real life. Right. Like that. That is really more about who he gets to access in himself. Well, yeah, that's see, that's so, so interesting. The 18 year old blonde is a very interesting thing because, you know, we're not I'm not naive. There's a socially conditioned, culturally sanctioned sexual fantasies. And one of them is youth connected mm -hmm. to youth for men and for women, but let's just stick with the issue around men. And so you have to say, well, so what is the intrinsic excitement of a young woman or a young or a boy? And here's where I go with that. 
is that there are a lot of things that are social and political in that situation. But the psychological part of it is that in relation to someone who's young, this is not a newsflash. The man feels younger. Yeah. Duh. (laughs) And it's a woman who has not been subject to the the frustrations and trials and tribulations of ordinary life. She's cleansed of all that. She has perfect skin. Yeah, yeah. And he identifies with her. And that is exciting to him because in his mind, he has all of these images of what makes a woman a woman. And a lot of these men grew up in families where they felt sorry for their mothers Mm. or they get married to a woman and they feel like they have to take care of the woman because there's something missing in her. So they have these images of these sort of damaged women, troubled women, and then they meet somebody who they can imagine is free of all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see what a powerful antidote that is in the short run. Right. And I mean, I think you wrote this in the book too. It's like, also maybe they get to be competent and knowledgeable and lead the way. And there's, there's nobody to impress because this young woman doesn't have any experience, you know, so they're absolved of any sense of she looks competition. Him, yeah, right. yeah. And, and whatever insecurities he may have about his uh, sexual potency, how great he is, his narcissism is reinforced and flattered by the woman all the right. time. All right. So this leads me to the question about is anything off limits? in our mind, (laughs) is any fantasy problematic and that we should be trying to somehow eradicate or, you know? Yeah, this is really, (laughs) no, I don't know exactly what you mean. I get asked this a lot. It's It's a complicated question. It's not easy to answer because on the objective end of it, there is no fantasy that isn't enjoyed by somebody. Mm -hmm. If you investigate the world of pornography as many people do, you find that there is a type of pornography for everybody. Yes. And it can be the most bizarre and extreme thing you can imagine. And there is a subgroup of people that preferentially go there. Yeah, it wouldn't be made if there weren't enough people to watch it. That's exactly right. You know, Robert Stoller, the psychoanalyst, called these micro dots, these moments of excitement in which there's a great deal of meaning condensed into one moment of excitement. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, do they hurt people in ways that sometimes I think yes. And here's the way I've, I've seen it. There are porn and sex addicts. You know, initially, I didn't think much of the concept of sexual addiction, Mm -hmm. but I came to see enough people who spent a huge amount of their time and their life in front of a computer terminal, masturbating. Men, almost always it's men, but, you know, women increasingly. And so in many of these cases, the man would masturbate and engage in sexual fantasy conversations or just looking and watching for four or five hours a day, 20 to 25 hours a week. There's no way that somebody can be present emotionally in a marriage, in a family, when they are spending 25 hours a week masturbating to whatever their fantasy is. Right. Don't you think so? Yeah. Has that been your experience too? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't see it that much in my practice exactly. And, and I don't usually conceptualize it as addiction as more problematic sexual behavior, but certainly it's a problem yeah. if it starts to take away from your presence and connection and your sex life with your partner. Right. If it starts to be this, you know, we're siphoning it off over here. (laughs) That's exactly Uh, right. Then it's not available for here. Right. Not that masturbation is bad, but it's a matter of degree. Right. No, there there are some cases. I see a guy now who um, gets involved in these long, prolonged four or five hour evening trips to hell and back in the particular fantasy world he likes. And he's just very ashamed of it. And he hates that in himself. One of the things he can do is quickly masturbate because once he quickly masturbates, he loses his, the urgency of the need to live in this pornographic world. That's this very interesting thing because the addictive quality of this 
isn't about having a quick orgasm. It's about embedding yourself and marinating in a certain sexual fantasy world that, as I think, serves certain functions psychologically. Right. But is the nature of the fantasy ever problematic? Is, in, is anything off limits if all we're going to do is think about it versus, I mean, obviously there are limits to what we can do in real life, right? Certain things are illegal. I don't think there is a limit to what we can think about. I, it would be hard for me to imagine that. It's, it's, it's a positive value that I have that people should be um, psychologically present, that they should be aligned with their values, and that they should you know, do something meaningful in the world for other people. That's my bias. So if your sexual fantasy life is so distracting, you can't do those things, then right. I think that's a problem. Right. And then we have to get to the bottom of what the anxiety is that this is trying to alleviate. And that anxiety is driving you away from your values, away from any notion of service, and away from love, actually. And, and I think that's harmful. Right, right. So it's not so much about the nature of what you're watching. It's not the maybe, content of it. Right, right. But it might be the degree to which you're struggling with this anxiety where this is an antidote and it's taking over your life. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And, and for certain things that are illegal to do in real life, those are That's also right. not, not problematic to fantasize about? I don't think they are un unless the person is even subtly enacting it. Right. But I don't think just the thought of it. So, so for instance, child pornography is huge. It's a huge mega zillion dollar business. Yeah. We can understand the attraction, the sexual attraction to children while condemning it in the real world and trying to understand it in the consulting room. But at the end of the day, the person has to stop. Yeah. See, I'm not someone who just thinks we're just going to analyze this forever. Because like you say, these are illegal things. There, yes. and, and there are so many ways that the person can inadvertently sometimes get in big trouble, even though they don't pose a threat. There are, for instance, FBI agents that are online right. attempting to recruit and test out whether men who go to these child pornography sites are downloading pornography. And if yeah. they are, they get busted. Right. And, and I've treated some guys in that situation who would no more touch a child than they would touch a hot stove. Right. But they enjoy the fantasy of it and they happen to download some pornography. And the next thing they knew, they got a knock at the door and FBI came and took their computer. Yeah. And then they get involved in the legal process as a sex offender and all of that. And, you know, their life goes to shit then, right. or goes to hell. Yeah. And that is, again, the difference of thinking about something versus doing it. There really yep. can be a difference between those Big two difference. things. But boy, you got to yep. be careful. Yeah, you sure do. And like you were sort of saying before, we're not going to change the basic nature of our fantasies, right? We shouldn't, no, we shouldn't no, really try can, to change this. We might have to change our behavior or what we're doing. I think you can experiment with and enlarge your repertoire. I think you can improve your repertoire. Okay. So I think if someone's locked into like the only way that I can ever get aroused is if I'm having sex with him or with her from the rear. Somebody said to me not long ago, it's the only way I can do it. Otherwise, I just, I'm no good. I lose my erection, blah, blah, blah. Well, why? It's because making eye contact gives the person too much of a sense of the other person's inner life that they have to worry about. Right, right. Responsible <laughs> for and guilty about. So if you're doing it from the rear, you can let go, be ruthless, uninhibited, and you don't have to have that. But- I have had people like that. And I said, well, let's try to work on this idea that or this belief that if you're looking in someone's eyes, it means you're supposed to take care of their inner life. Why the hell do you have to do that? And then we're off and running into an investigation. And sometimes the net effect of that is the person can begin to experiment 
with a different way of being, even though they never lose the sort of core loyalty that they have to the one way of doing things. Right, right. It might be their favorite, right? The thing they respond most to, but they've got more flexibility. They do. They can just try out a few different roles and, you know, and I think that can be very helpful, but you don't get rid of it. Right. So where can people find you? What would you like to mention that you have out in the world that people might want to follow or reach out? Well, they can read my books. They can, you (laughs) know, they can get my books. And um, my website is michaelbader.com. And they'll see that, you know, I write on a number of subjects. As I was saying to you before, I wrote for years about sexuality. And then I got interested in writing about politics and psychology. So I have a whole bunch of things about that are informed by my progressive liberal politics. <laughs> and, you know, when, when I was um, an undergraduate, I was a political activist at Berkeley. And then for reasons that are complicated, I went into the therapy field. But I never lost my sense of engagement with political ideas. And yeah. I just thought, well, now I'm going to see if I can bring those two things together. Cool. So, so I think some of your listeners might be interested in some of those things. Right. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, you're very welcome. You're a great interviewer. I really enjoyed it. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, there are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advanced access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web. And you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.